I mean, I am not doing that stuff. What I do for the living, so. And we are live. Season 3, episode 12 of CCX2. What's going on? Sal? How, how's got... everybody doing tonight? I'm, I'm just, I'm looking at the comments. I'm, I'm waiting for the, the comments to stream in uh, to uh, get mad at us for being one minute early. So I think that's right. what might happen. <laughs> Usually we're like three minutes late because of somebody else who is not here tonight getting over a cold. So Brandon will not be with us. So, but uh, well, we've got a great guest tonight. So, I many of you are probably familiar. We have Steve Fisher of Sentinel Concepts with us tonight, and uh, we're we're going to talk about some low light, all the technology and uh, techniques that go into shooting and in the dark. Um, and we'll get into plenty of other stuff as well. Uh, Steve, very experienced uh, professional firearms instructor. We'll let him introduce himself. So again, if you have any particular uh, questions that you want to ask for uh, somebody with a lot of experience, and, and Steve, you're definitely one of, uh, there, there's many firearms instructors out there. I'd say you're one of the relatively few that you do it full time, correct? That is that that is that is all you do so there's no uh compensating for such experience so again any any questions that you have for our guest tonight put them in the chat um steve introduce yourself tell our people uh about what you about yourself and what you do uh, my name is daryl and i'm a, oh, wrong <laughs> so um <laughs> wrong guest wrong guest <laughs> Wrong, wrong guest. I love Daryl. Right, um, right. Love, wrong guest. Guys, yes. I love that you guys have Daryl on, right? I, <laughs> I just love Daryl to death. Uh, Steve Fisher, owner of Central Concepts, uh, firearms guy, been teaching for, seems forever now, at least 20 odd years, um, in and out of the industry on multiple hats. Besides the training side of the house, there's been consulting for several companies from product development, testing, uh, from everything from lights to optics to firearms. It's it's just a nonstop uh, across the board kind of intertwined family. And the most important thing is you have a very good beard, which of course is, oh, and tattoos. Okay, so, I mean, yeah. Do we even have to go on? I mean, yes. we've got everything that's that's necessary for a great firearms instructor. Look, I, right? I, I had the beard before it was cool. <laughs> like, like Costa made me shave my beard when I was working at Magpul. He's like, bro, that beard is way too epic for some time. So he made me actually shave my beard. It was in my contract clause there to shave my beard. So crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, his got definitely it. much larger over time, right? Because oh, yeah. you look at those old DVDs from way back when it was just like a goatee. Yeah, so it was. It was. he must have grown the beard, and then they sold a lot more DVDs. <laughs> so they went they went with that. So, uh, but yeah, so so Steve is a very knowledgeable instructor, teaches just about everything, and um, like many of the guests we've had on the show before, I just recently trained with Steve for the first time. Um, I'd like to get at least some of the instructors that I've trained with uh, on, uh, certainly. And uh, I took a low-light handgun class with Steve Fisher last Friday night, and it was really awesome. So, um, again, we, we appreciate the last minute uh, coming coming on the show. We figured we'd get you scheduled sometime for July or August, but due to uh, the schedule opening up for, for said reasons, um, the, you, you were able to jump right in, and that that's great. So, um you know, when it comes to low light, uh, I'll just uh, give everybody my experience with that. I admit that it's actually the first dedicated low light class I've taken. And I've taken lots of shooting classes, right? Uh, this is the first dedicated low light class I took. And I presumed I would come away saying, yeah, you get way more out of the dedicated class than all of the different pieces that I've seen. And many classes, you know, show some low light techniques, you know, flashlight holds and all that stuff. I can definitely confirm now that for those of you interested in low light training, 
Don't waste time with all the other stuff that gets tacked on to regular classes. Take a dedicated low light class. Cause I can say Steve coming out of it, you gave a lot of context and honestly, most of the techniques, I saw some new things that, that you did. Most of the techniques though, I've seen before, but minus all the context, like why, why are we doing this? Why does this work? Et cetera. Um, in your experience for the concealed carrier, which is primarily what our audience is. Why should they be carrying a light and why should they learn how to use it? So big question there, right? Um, shooting is the easy portion of that <clears throat> for the most part, but having a light, right? Um, we spend a lot of time in dark environments, um, depending on your job, your livelihood, what you're doing, travel times, any of those things, right? It's dark a lot of times of the day. Um, not only that, but you, but you know, misnomers about the light, the light can be used in the daytime as well. The light is still part of a, what I would almost consider like a force continuum, so to speak. Like I can still use a powerful handheld white light to gain some sort of temporary compliance. I can gain information in depth and distance with it. Um, overall, like most people will use a flashlight as a task tool. Mm -hmm. It's something mm -hmm. they've dropped, something they lost. They're looking for key locks, doorknobs. I don't know. They're looking for their vehicles and parking structures, whatever that case is. If you're going to carry a gun, though, you should carry a light, especially if you're going to be doing anything remotely, even in the dusk to dark hours, like even if you just leave one in your vehicle, but always have a light of some sort that is useful to you because, well, you just, it's like carrying a gun, right? You don't know. So right. why wouldn't I have all the tools to go along with that, right? Um And, and that's it's kind of an important thing. Like most people don't really look at it. They're like, well, I've got a weapon light. I'm good. So some have all of the lights, some choose no lights, right? So, so these are all variables in the equation based on what you're doing, what your livelihood is like. Like if you're in bed by nine o'clock, cool. Like I don't go outside <laughs> after nine, like oh, I'm done. Like doors are locked, <laughs> vault doors are down. Like I, I don't leave, no. Um, a, a light is just multifaceted, right? It's everything from an offensive defensive to a task tool. There's mm -hmm. nothing it really cannot accomplish in the grand scheme of things if you have one. You know, what, what I find interesting is how many people carry a gun, they don't carry a light. And I think a lot of that m maybe comes from the fact that most people live perpetually in a suburban or urban environment. And they spend little time in the dark because I can tell you as a country boy, and I know you are too, Steve, um, mm -hmm. I have spent a lot of time in pitch black environments and I've used a light many times to light up either two-legged or four-legged mm -hmm. something. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's real. You, you know, I'm pretty remote, very rural. Um, I, you know, I lived in the city life for a while, too. And I think a lot of people miss it because if you really think about the places you go, right, you're like, every gas station you go to is like lit up, right? Every, right. Every, most every good convenience store, gas station, big box store, a lot of restaurants, uh, places that people go to daily, right? They have to look at that environment and make decisions for the next trip. So the next, you know, the next time they're out. Um so for me, like it's it's very commonplace. Like always have a good handheld light on my person. Always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and the um, the evolution of the technology. I I'm trying to think of the very first like serious light for the time. I think this was like the late '90s. I think it was some early model Surefire. It had literally 40 lumens, and I was just blown away with how bright it was compared to you know like the old school mag lights and that kind of yeah. stuff. And I was thinking, wow! And and I had just happened to be hunting that week that I got it, so I was spending time at a hunting cab, you know, with pitch black at night, and I could not believe how bright that thing was. And you know, that was it was literally 40 lumens. Oh, oh yes. So, so, you know, the original Surefire, which was laser products, right? Laser devices, uh, laser devices before they became Surefire. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, the 3P, it was a single cell 123 battery with about, you know, 40 to 60 lumens of light, depending on what mm -hmm. it was. I don't even remember off the top of my head anymore. And then they had the 6P. And if you had a 6P, man, that was rock star status because they had two batteries. And it got like 125 lumens or something like that. Ridiculous numbers, you know. So all, all those things, you know, the technology, the, watching the technological race with lights has been awesome. It's been absolutely outstanding watching it over the past, you know, 10 years, realistically. It's gotten just way out of control. 
So let me let me ask you this uh, because I know you you've been not only teaching it but you you have a uh, you know background in a lot of things where you were working with lights before they were what they are now. Um, when cops were running around with the old school, you know, the the three like D cell mag lights and yeah. stuff, um, was the shooting with lights becoming a thing at that time, or uh, I, I imagine it's dramatically changed just because the tool itself is so much more capable? You, you know, the light technology, right? Like everybody had like a four cell mag light, five cell mag light, whatever they were, because they served dual purpose for a lot of guys, right? It was a light and an impact tool. Sure. For, for a lot of places. And that's ultimately what they were. Um, they were big, they were bulky, they were heavy, right? And even before that, you had tail lights and you had, you know, SL20s from Streamlight and you had, you know, the old big metal ever ready lights. I mean, there, there, there's always been lights. I mean, you can trace back lights through history, right? Going back, I think somebody has always that little drawing shows up every now and then somewhere, the schematic of it, like from the 1800s, where it's like a lantern on a pistol kind of thing hanging. Um, <laughs> I still have no idea. Like, that's the Amish fighting light. I like that thing a lot. Um, you know, all blinding seven lumens of it, but it, you know, the history of it, they've always been here. They, they've always been here. They're, they've always been in use. Um, it's just techniques and information that has been gathered, you know, better over the years, you know, first person accounts of it, body cameras, things of that nature. Like we're seeing more, we're understanding more with the lights and what we actually need today. So <laughs> it's kind of cool. One thing I'll mention um, out of the class, which I thought was pretty interesting, was you talk about techniques for dominating an environment and taking control of an environment with the light. So you don't you don't promote stuff that seems to I I, I want to say it's going out of vogue, at least with the guys who know what they're doing. But the mall ninja crap of, you know, running around, turning your light on and off and all that kind of stuff. Um you you definitely go down a very different road of dominating the situation with that light and and and, and explain that like why would you turn it off once you're in that situation i thought that was really really great for a lot of people right there's different sets of rules or you know practices really for you have guys that were teaching a lot of stuff based off military actions right so you know depending on the environments they're in and what they're doing in a team environment um, you know, work at a minimum, minimal, most minimal amount of light possible, right? Okay, got it, fine. Your, your light is noise, it's dirty air, it's broadcasting positions. Okay, got it. I'm in my house. I'm in a parking lot around my vehicle, right? There's already lighting there. There's transitional lighting zones to deal with all these things. And granted, there is a time to work in that minimalist of light environment. Absolutely, there is. There's a time to mask or shield movement like that. Um, but a lot of it really is like, look, why are you going to get information segmented? I, I don't want my information segmented when I'm trying to process and develop and formulate plans either during my movement, my actions, or, or future actions that are going to happen with inside that time frame. But I need all the information I need, and I need all that information. I'll be like, they'll, they'll shoot at the light. They'll shoot at you in the daytime, too. But, you know, they'll, they will. The guys are like, you could hide. Like, have you ever actually, like, really looked at? You know, most guys bring it from a range, you know, a range study. Like, you can see people move in the dark. It's never that dark that the color and contrast and movement of a human being in the shadows and in the dark will draw attention. You can be shot at. You will be shot at. We, we, we've proven it in force on force in, in other actions, right? So this is nothing new. But because of newer light technology and the capabilities of the lights, we have the ability to dominate that area with white light, overpower it, gain a form of, you know, minimal time of compliance out of whatever or whoever that is, right, to allow us decision making as well. So was, there's a lot of people that are still living in the 1970s um, with information or 80s or these things where it was like, you got to move into dark stuff. We're like, well, I'm not searching in a thousand warehouse, you know, square foot warehouse here. Like I'm talking 1200, 1500 square foot, you know, house, if I'm even doing that. And, and for a lot of people, they just, they just don't understand where well, they're going to shoot at the light. I'm like, yeah, they, they probably will. Um, until, and you guys saw the demo at class, right? Like I, I, I go ahead, shoot, shoot back at me when I've got that mod light in, in your face, mm -hmm. it was impossible. You, you can shoot at things, but I'm going to see your actions, your intent before it ever happens, because I already have all that information available to me before you ever even get a chance to get the gun up indexed towards me at that point. Right. By that time, it's lost. And, and the, again, right, it's the Internet per, uh, per, 
God, I can't even talk tonight. The Eventually. internet keeps, yeah, the, the internet keeps spewing this garbage by giving everybody a voice, which is fine because it's the internet. You have that right. Um, but if you don't know what you're talking about, shut up. But it, 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 you see it all the time, and it gives everybody this voice to talk about something they have no idea about, or they saw something in the video from the 1980s from Paladin, or some other thing where you only need 300 lumens. Like, I still fight that, too. So, like, nobody, most people that talk have never faced dark adaptation and then being zapped with an overpowering, overwhelming source of energy. Mm hmm and mm -hmm. we, we saw that in the class. And he was like, yeah, what about... And he's like, ah! It's like yeah. melting his face off, like, you know, Tomb Raider kind of thing. Or Raiders of the Lost Ark. And he's like, okay, I get what you're saying. now." I said, yeah. Right. So, so there is an effect. There is a desired response that happens from that and allows us time. See, and that that's another, you know, great example of why really taking a dedicated class focused only on this subject. And then in, you know, the majority of the hours in darkness where you're able to see this... Um, I, I just don't think you can get a good handle on it with without that. Oh, one thing I liked about your curriculum is I think it is completely relevant to the concealed carrier, obviously, like even these principles of you want to dominate the situation with the light. You know, let's face it, for the concealed carrier, 99 times out of 100, if you have to light somebody up, you're not going to have to shoot them. Right. So this idea of you're going to run around like a ninja in the dark and all that, it's just it it's just not applicable to what the civilian does typically. You know, and that's what I really liked about the 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 class is it focused on techniques for that. One thing I'll mention that uh, really blew my mind, which was uh, an eye opener, is uh, when you specifically did the demonstration of how the light actually shields you if you're backlit. And yeah, it's one of those things like it seems simple, but unless you see it, you may not think about it because um, the light giving you cover. So it masks your movement like I'm aware of that principle. In fact, we, we did um, an article some time back about the reasons you should be carrying a light. One of the things I mentioned in that article was, you know, as a civilian, if you draw your gun on the wrong person. That can get you something called aggravated assault. It's not a good thing, right? So, you know, if you're in a dark environment, that bright light in somebody's face, they can't see that if you do draw or even just put your hand on your gun. But you took it a step further with showing how it actually gives you cover if there's light behind you. And you demonstrated that you turn off the light and you can see your silhouette so easy. You hit somebody in the face with that bright light and you just, you know, magic trick, you disappear, you know. So, again, it, it's those kind of things. You guys have the chance. If you've never done low light training, you know, if, if Steve's in your area doing a low light class, I, I highly, highly recommend it. Real quick, before we move into anything else, I wanted to mention that we're giving out a Streamline TLR1 for anybody that's uh, asking questions. We'll pick one and announce the winner next show. And we got to give our sponsors some love. So the first one up is Ammunition Depot. You can use the code CCX2 at checkout. Gives you free shipping off of orders, $150 and more. They usually have a lot of the popular calibers in stock. Good prices. They ship quick. They got other stuff in stock like weapon-mounted lights and flashlights and all that good stuff. So I know you've ordered some stuff from them recently, Sal, I believe. Yeah, and again, I've said this before with them. They, they've actually been around for some time. Uh, I remember years ago when we went through whatever the last crisis was, you know, ammo crisis, that that uh, Ammunition Depot would have uh, stuff in stock a lot of times when others did not. So, you know, de definitely keep your eye on them and what they have in stock. And buy stuff while it's in stock. We always talk about this. When you see it, if you need it, buy it. Because Lord knows the next thing is just right around the corner. And, uh, in fact, maybe we can get Steve to uh, to talk to that some. Because I, I've heard you ranting and raving uh, here and there about that, Steve, about the ammunition situation. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, ammo. You know, people take a lot of things for granted. Oh, there's no reason for this. It's just the government doing this. And be like, okay, stop, settle down. Um, <laughs> you, you know, what people don't realize about it is a lot of the components come from overseas, right? And there's this thing called OSHA, right? It's amazing. So a lot of things can only be <laughs> built overseas. It's crazy talk, right? Um, I mean, there's only so many times a year, you know, powder can be extruded and stuff for primers, raw materials, brass, 
copper lead like we just don't go to backyard and dig that up right neither, neither does federal or whoever at that point you know so a lot of these things come into play um you know, this past year, we're seeing, you know, five to eight plus percent increases almost quarterly, um, depending on the time of year and who and what. Um, we're going to continue to see people like, well, prices are coming down. What people are seeing now is the ammo that was in the pipeline that is freed up, that was already panic bought, overstocked by the distributors. That's why it's kind of there and just kind of hovering right now. But believe me, I'm sure it's going to do this again on that scale because a lot of that ammo, you know, they, they, if they've been buying again, right it, it's it's expensive right now like i've seen it i know what the numbers look like from the distributor level i'm like oh that was another eight percent oh god this is gonna be bad in another year you know and, and while it's here and while it's accessible like i told guys if you if you are going to pre-plan your 2023 training season right your practice get sessions get it now think about what those look like buy it while you can get it buy it while you can get it in stock as it goes it's coming down like look dude it went down twelve dollars at whoever per thousand that's only because they have a lot of it in right now. You, you know, they're, they're cutting it down to whatever profit margin, whatever. Yeah, I get it. Everybody has to do it. Um, that's not going to be the way it's going to be for a long time. And I could be wrong, and I hope I'm wrong. But from what I've gotten <laughs> from other industry meetings, it, it's very hit and miss right now still. And what's available is what's available. And, you know, certain things are going to suffer again probably later this year. But it's, it's just where we're at. So, you know, pre-plan if you're looking at two classes next year, right? You know, put up call it 2000 rounds, right? You know, have, have that ammo, put up an extra thousand for practice sessions, you, you know, or whatever that case may be. Um, but yeah, it, it's real. We're stuck in this for a while. We're, we're going to be here for a while. I mean, there are places right now that are still three to four years on backlog of ammunition. That'll be that until they get their orders filled. Um, so it, it's not pretty. It's not going to get better anytime soon. Maybe someday, but you're never going to see the days of a dollar, you know, of one fifty a thousand for nine mil blazer again. Like those right. days are gone. Right. Those, those days are gone. So. Right. Right. And and you know, if it does, this was a whole different animal than even you know the the post twenty twelve thing that that happened. Yeah. You know, because I I know for a while we were saying yeah those days are gone. Did come back down. Even that though took two or three years to yeah. come back to normal. It, this this it, is a it, whole nother thing. Yeah. Perfect storm. You had yeah. an election cycle. You had this COVID thingy. You had this. All these things. All these things fell into play. You know, it's just a perfect storm of everything for a while. Mm. So if you see it, buy it, guys. That that would be the advice, yeah. certainly. So, uh, uh, Luke, did you um, – I see you flag some of the comments. Yeah. Do you want to pull any of those up for, for um, Steve to answer? I'll start with one. This guy took a class from you. He's saying, hey, uh, Jim Gibbons. Yeah. Let's see. There was, is there a recommended or preferred lumen or strobe? Ooh, so, so that's an interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm not a strobing fan. I, I don't like a technique turned into a product, right? Different wavelengths, stuff like that. Strobes are very disorientating on both sides of the coin. Um, and for information gathering, I prefer as much light as possible. So lumens is, you know, basically the amount of light right that's coming out of the thing candelas is the amount of energy emitted and that's kind mm -hmm. of a numbers game and we talked a little bit about that in class um i go for more candelas than i do lumens um because i want energy out of the light right it's like you, you can have this or you can have that but you can kind of have both so I, I ultimately look for a light that offers me good lumen output say a thousand just arbitrary number um but on top of that if it offers me sixty thousand in candela like that's the light i'm going after even if it's 650 lumens of light, but 60, 70,000 in candela, I want that, right? I want all that energy because that's what's going to help based on the head, the reflector design, uh, you, you know, as far as the beam patterns. Find as much as you can get and use it. And that's just the simplest thing. And, I, you know, and people need to understand this. By the time, you know, and, it, and this came from Surefire a million years ago, that at 14 years old, you know, a, a male pre reaches like peak night visual acuity, right? Like, like their, their, their peak vision at that point in time at 14 years old. By the time you reach 45, it requires four times the amount of light at 45 years old as it did at 14 to see that well again. And the thing is this, what people miss a lot is they miss battery life, mm -hmm. right? So energy drain, that gets very real. So you start, you start dissipating that within, let's say, 20 minutes, right? Depending on the light and who makes it, whatever, 20 to 30 minutes. Then you get to a certain amount of runtime energy and lumen output, right? It's all starting to trickle down. Then you have environmental factors, right? Env environmental factors are going to eat up light. Other light is going to eat up other light. So energy defeating energy. All these things are very real in the grand scheme of things. So I tell guys, get as much as you can get and start there. 
like like ultimately like this this old garbage of you know well it's 300 lumens anything after that's useless you go blind i'm like sorry about that but 1984 called they want their comments back um nobody cares right it's it's it, 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 it's ignorance at this point while 300 is better than zero take as much as you can get mm-hmm Mm-hmm. And, and again, I'll, I'll revisit that when you take the class where the majority of it is spent at night, one mm-hmm. of the things very interesting you had the class do was uh, we turned around to the field behind us. You had everybody turn on the light so we could see the different beam patterns, mm-hmm. see how much throw. Um, spoiler alert, the mod lights seem to slay everything else. <laughs> they they were, they, yeah, they, they were impressive, no doubt. Uh, you know, but uh, to be honest, I I had a streamlight uh, yeah. the the XLX. That's yeah. the that's the one thousand lumen one, mm-hmm. and I was amazed at how yes. tight the beam was and how much throw it had. So, and that's like a seventy five dollar light. So, you know, it's not like you have to spend hundreds to get a really yeah. bright usable yeah. light. So, so, but that was very cool. I mean, the it, but you <laughs> could see a huge difference. And to be honest, it wasn't really so much the lumen count, but like that beam pattern. And I guess just the other quality components of the light. Yeah. You know, having a a really tight beam is always impressive to people because I was, you can see further. I'm like, well, you can also see a ship's light out in the ocean. That's, you you know, 10 miles away. Uh, That's just science, right? You you can't dispute that. Um, (laughs) What really matters to me is the, the, the overall beam pattern and what it does with inside a reasonable distance. Um, like if I have a handheld flashlight that gives me a lot of good beam out to 25, 30 yards, right? I I would be acceptable of that light. I I absolutely would. But what does it do in the middle ground? Like what else does it do situationally? Does it open up my environment for me and allow me to see middle ground between things very well too? So I'm not just getting sucked into the distance aspect of it. Right. Right. Well, let me, let me ask you this, uh, in terms of, um, like weapon mounted lights, most of those Mm. seem to be built to throw well for handguns specifically, Mm. most of them seem to be designed to throw a very wide beam, Mm. not so much the focus hotspot. Is that by design with the idea you're likely using this maybe in your house, you want that wide throw? That's a lot of it, right? Limited, um, what we call it, you know, like limited distance with a handgun for most places. Like, I'm a firm believer you should be capable with a handgun to 50 yards. Like you should be absolutely capable with a defensive slash offensive handgun to 50 yards. You absolutely should. Um, For various reasons, I'm not even going to drive into all that because somebody will be like, oh, you'll never be justified in shooting somebody at 10 beyond 10 yards. And like, okay, shut up. Um, So, God, the internet once again. So with that, right, but now we have guns and dots. So we have increased capabilities and abilities depending on the shooter and the gun. It's never a bad thing having more light. Mm-hmm. Right? It's it's never a bad thing having more light. And, and while like TLRs are a great light on a handgun, Surefire X300 is a good light on a handgun. Um, <clears throat> mod light, reigning champ right now on a pistol. No no two ways about it. Like mm-hmm. uh, ultimately the best. I, I'm I'm not paid with those cats or anything. I use a lot of their lights. Like I said in class, you know, I've I've been given lights from several manufacturers to test and try and use them. And mod light is just my winner for the factors that I talked about in that class. There's a lot of good lights. Get one that you can afford. Put it on a gun. Have it. Good on you. Mm. You know, there's a lot of good choices. But but ultimately, just finding the right beam. Finding the right beam is what really matters to you, what looks really good to you, where you plan ultimately on having that and using that. Yeah. Did I click that or did you click that? I, I just did. Yeah. I that's, just, uh... just did it. There you mm. go. Garland. So it's handgun light or handheld light. Um, I, I feel there's a happy balance, right? Handgun lights are easy. They're very easy. Um, while they can be used differently than just a point-click interface, uh, a handheld light gives you the most versatility out of everything. I can use it from a pre-action, post-action. Um, I can use it as a search task tool. Um, I can use it while still searching with a pistol without indexing the gun on somebody. I can umbrella light. I can baseboard light. I can do a lot of variables with that um, and directionally. That are a lot more um, what's the word i'm looking for acceptable in most cases right even for a house gun uh even like my even though my home guns have lights attached to them i still have a handheld light right um mm-hmm. because ultimately i don't know what it is that i'm pointing that muzzle at currently and depending on how the house is constructed or what it's constructed of you know a, a weapon light is always a good thing right most people have a hard enough time shooting as it is with two hands on the gun let alone one which which, which we saw 
having both to interface with each other is a great thing. And I, I, and I tell guys this, I'm very open about it. I rarely, rarely, rarely ever carry a gun that has a light on it on my person. I was going to ask um, about that. Generally, 90% of the time, you will catch me with just a handheld, not a weapon light. House guns, duty guns, completely different animal. Right. Um, but for the most of the time, no, because there's no really good light to put on a Glock 48, right? There's no really good light to put on a revolver. There's no a, a J frame, right? There's no really good light to put on certain guns. Um, while they can be acceptable of them with the current mounting systems that are out there, some better lights like the TLR7, I think, is a great compact mini light. It's probably the best mini light going right now for smaller mm -hmm. guns. Um, it still suffers in some areas, but ultimately, uh, you know, to answer his question, uh, both, but spend more time with a handheld than you would a weapon like. Yeah. And I think in, in the class we, that came up and you had said, Steve, that, you know, when you're out and about the handheld is a must have the weapon mountain light is a nice to have, um, yes. you know, certainly for a house gun, right? There's, there's no downside to it. Obviously, if it's not a gun that needs to go in a holster, no downside, certainly. But yeah, the the carry the the handheld is very important. This mm -hmm. this is um, this is interesting. Um, you showed us actually um, that one apparatus. Is, is it a surefire thing? Whatever the pressure pad is, the uh, DG the, switch. Yeah. So I yeah. think this is what they're and and mention what you talked about with that. Like it's a great option for you know the spouse or somebody in the house who is not a serious gun person, but you want to have it set up so that when they pick up the gun, the light comes on. Yeah, we'll, we'll answer this one question here. Uh, as far as the light laser um, that illuminates automatically when this gun, gun is drawn, Surefire had a program set up with the Master Fire holster uh, with like the XH35 and 55 lights sometime back. That would allow you to do it, but it's a very big open type rig, you know, that you would have. It's not really a concealment rig. Um, ultimately, you don't want the light and laser on automatically uh, as soon as you draw the gun, right? That there's a few variables to that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's more of a presentation thing, but what you are afforded, right, if you do that, is the DG switch uh, from Surefire for the X300 light or the X400, which is a light laser combo. So what you can do with the DG switch is once you grab the gun and pull the gun from the holster, obviously the light is going to activate when you grab the gun because the, the module for it is built in with a pressure switch that goes to the actual pistol grip of the gun. So if that's something you're squeezing when you're grabbing the gun? Right? Correct. As soon as you grab the pistol, right, you squeeze it, you're squeezing that pressure pad and it's, it. and it's on, it's there. Some, some can say it's a detriment uh, in certain tactical environments, which yes, absolutely truthful. Uh, where it really shines, like we talked about in class, significant others in the household. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you have a bedroom gun, kitchen gun, nightstand gun, I don't know, whatever your, your thing is, right? You should have guns everywhere. That's just me. Shower gun. Um, gun everywhere, shower gun. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, that a DG switch is really good, especially if the significant other is not familiar with switchology, right? They're, they're not going to get under stressors because they don't train to it. They don't practice it. Um, all they have to do is pick up the gun and grab the gun and boom, light is on not a bad thing as long as they're maintaining the grip of the pistol firmly the light will stay activated that that to me is the best of all worlds is to go with the dg switch with the x300 x400 light setup yeah yeah and and again when you went over that in the class that what resonated with me for for the untrained mm -hmm partner in the home again it is that fire extinguisher gun right and yeah. and if it is a situation where it's low light for the safety of everybody involved having the light come on automatically i think it would certainly have nice. more benefits than negatives yeah yeah it, it can again limited application for the context of the situation and and again right the the, the capabilities or abilities of the end user and, and a dg switch is also very beneficial for one-handed work as well so right Right. Hey, that that's another good one, Luke. Yeah, um, I think Garland's going to win. He's asking the best and the most uh, questions tonight, so <laughs> he's a regular. Mm, I've seen many ways to hold handheld over your gun hand or elevated angle. So uh, a couple ways of doing things, right? You, you will often see guys doing like a Harry's technique, right? Mm -hmm. Harry's technique is a very awesome technique. It's super stable. Uh, offers good recoil control, good good accuracy with that. It also allows us to do angles and corners and things like that on our searches, if that's what you're doing. Uh, but what it also affords you to do is, you know, I've been teaching this for eons, is that I can take the gun, put the gun in a high compressed ready position right here and have the light angled with the handheld while I search without muzzling anyone. 
Right. Um, very few places teach it. A um, few guys picked it up for me years ago. I don't know who else has done it over the years. Um, it, it's been one of the most effective ways to have both in play at the same time without actually muzzling something or someone. Uh, you'd be surprised uh, how many guys finally had picked up on that and are teaching it now, which is outstanding. I'm just glad the information's out there. Not saying I originated. God only knows because nothing is original in this industry. Um, <laughs> But there was very few people that I'd ever saw in any low-light programs that I'd been taking that it was ever taught. And so when I started teaching it pretty openly, I was like, oh, wait a minute. This is pretty cool. Um, for me, I run three handheld light positions, and, and that's it. I, I, I run with an FBI slash modified FBI, a high index or gun to, or light to head index, however you want to call it this week. And then I run Harry's. Those are the main three that I use, and those are the only three that I live. Mm-hmm. Do you, what do you feel about those? What is that? The switchback that has the kind of ring? How do those where I've never used one? So we're talking light. So that's a uh, touchy subject. I, no, no, no. So I, I like <laughs> the guys at Theorem. I like the switchback. Um, it's useful for some people that will take the time to understand its use and who can manipulate it correctly based on hand size and indexing with the protected caps of the light uh, where the activation switch is. Like it doesn't work real well for me because of my hand size. While I can maneuver the light, I can't flip it usually back in and get the knuckle to press the light on, on my lights because of the size of my hand. Um, I also like don't being tied into things. I, I do not, even though the theorem has a breakaway, which is absolutely outstanding and it should, and is a very good tool for those people. Um, some consider it bulky when they're carrying it. So they have the new version. It doesn't have the ring. It's just a clip. Um, and, and again, right. Plus and minuses and practice is right. really it. And I'm, I'm not the one to tell somebody don't use that because it's, it's, I'm not that guy. Like, Hey man, if it works for you, awesome. And these are the way it can be manipulated and used. Track it. Good job. Stay with it. You know, for me, right. it's not my personal best. I have them. I use them. I know how to use them. It's not my overall thing. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, what you were talking about with Harry's, I'll admit that um, I'll practice more with it now with based on some of the techniques you showed us with it. Uh, I, I can say this about that technique probably a decade ago. I, I think I saw Mike Seeklander doing it with just, you know, the, the hold at the temple. And, you know, again, with my limited low light experience, I've seen the techniques in classes and I've shot with them at night on my own time. And the way I always looked at it was like, you know what, as a civilian, I'm probably going to be like this, lighting somebody up and saying, hey, who's that? And if I have to shoot them, I'm going straight out. And that was good enough for me, although the Harry's, okay, if you're on a strong side barricade, you got to get the gun on that side, right? So, okay, maybe it has application for that. Mm -hmm. But after the stuff you showed us with it, it seems like, okay, it, it, it's an old technique, but the you showed us the ability to actually be looking around with the muzzle inverted either down or up. So now you don't have to be pointing the gun at everybody, and then you can still be immediately ready to go to uh, a much more stable platform. I mean, for shooting, there's no question that it's easier Correct. to shoot with Harry's than with, you know, a, a temple index or whatever we want to call it. Sure. Yeah, so that that was definitely a cool takeaway. Sort of uh, a a reinvention of a technique that has been around for decades, hasn't it? I mean, yeah. even oh, in the seventies, yeah. the cop movies, right? They're running yeah. around with the, the Harry's. Yeah, you, you'd be surprised at the number of techniques. There's probably eight or ten of them out there plus that are just whatever. You go. That's why that doesn't get mentioned anymore. Don't do that. That's bad. Don't 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 do that one. Don't do this one. And as the lights have changed, so have some of the techniques as well. Side right. buttons, rear button techniques, size of the lights. It, 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 some things have all uh, have all helped with these changes or progress into where we're at today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of one of the teaser I'd throw out about the class. Um, have you ever thought about how you clear malfunctions or reload the gun with a light in your hand? That's right. right. Yeah. Easy. So yeah. Wait. Once you, once you see it, you'll say, man, why didn't I think about that? Why did I never think of that? So, no, uh, so Steve shows some great techniques for doing exactly that too. You know, the point you made like about the rings, Luke, uh, because again, that goes like way back. I've seen guys with like, they used to make rings out of a, a string so they could flip it around to the back of their hand and all this stuff, man, Steve just showed us the way to hold the light so you can do all that stuff, you know, with it, with it still in your hand. Right. That was pretty neat. I try. <laughs> Kevin, it's sentinelconcepts.com. The link should be in the description. He's got a class schedule on there. And uh, D 
do you plan on coming to Louisiana? I used to teach in Louisiana actually quite a bit. I used to teach down in Hammond uh, quite a bit. I, I haven't been back in Louisiana in a few years to teach, um, you know, for various reasons, either economic wise, they just weren't filling or whatever was going on at the time, or, you know, everybody knows how to shoot a gun and they just don't need it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, plus there's already some really good trainers down there. You, you know, the guys from VAT are there, um, field of dudes, you know, great guys. They, they've got some good programs there. Um, I don't know. You know, if, if, if I get a host again, I might, I might think about it again. I, I get to Texas quite a bit, which is pretty close. Right. Uh, depending on where at, you know, I'm generally over in the Houston area, a lot of teaching uh, on that side of the frame. But yeah, you, you know, if, if it comes about, I'd love to get there. I, I really would. I, I've got some good friends that, that, I, that I absolutely miss their food, um, which is the best part <laughs> about being in Louisiana. I'm not going to lie. Um, you, you know, it, it's great to go fish for reds and then come back and have lunch and dinner. You, you know, it's just, it's absolutely awesome. Like, right. I love being in Louisiana. I really do. I, I would love to get back there again sometime. We'll just see how it plays out. You know, like, I can't be everywhere, you know, 70 some courses a year on the road, 250 oh, days. Wow. Like you, you try, but like, like, it never ends up well. And the way things are currently going, man, who knows next year, you know, 2023 is going to be sketchy with, with, with inflation and everything. It keeps going in fuel prices. Nobody, nobody has an idea right now what it's going to look like. So, Do you mostly drive everywhere, Steve? Yeah. Outside of a few specific uh, fly courses, um, most everything I do is drive time because I do a lot of multiple city hops and cost benefit wise after I sat down and did it a couple of times each way. Um, it was just cheaper to drive. Yeah, it takes time, but you know, I get to stop, see some buddies, see some great country. Uh, you know, get to do the back road travel, do a little camping on the way out here and there instead of hotels. Uh, you know, set the hammock up. It's always a nice time. You know, just to be outside, and it's it's great. And I, and I actually like the drive time better than I like the fly time. Like I said, a few specific courses I still fly for. Um, but but ultimately, yeah, man, uh, the trucks the truck is the rolling range rig. You know, I, I get in it, I go, and that's it. Mm -hmm. You had a Ford Raptor, right? No, inside inside <laughs> yes, very inside joke. Pre-show inside joke. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry about all your rings. Um, anyway, <laughs> so I told you don't buy that truck. You never listen to me. What, what do I know? Yeah. So, um, we, we don't have to keep beating the low light stuff, but mm. uh, again, last thing I'll say about it: take the class if if he's around. You take the low light class, but um, you know, Steve, you you train so many people. These kind of questions that come up, what? Mm. What do you what do you see? I mean, what is the issue that plagues, especially you know, new shooters? What what's the important stuff? Uh, Williams or just asked one about this. Um, so for like a million years, right, right, there are these, these variations between practical and precision, right? Everything that we do with these guns is going to be based upon size, value, distance, and time of target. Everything we do, everything we do is going to be based on the size of target, distance of the target. Uh, time to engage right in the mm -hmm. value of that shot so all those things are important um in, in like a lot of places for a million years you know, it was always front sight you know perfect front sight alignment 490 degree right angles well that's precision and that was a very slow methodical trigger press 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 sooner or later that shot, shot's gonna break mm -hmm. right um mm -hmm. when you look at things in the way some of us you know it's been taught for years it's like look Two most, important, two most important aspects of the, of the gun itself, right? And your interface with the gun is the way you grip the gun. Um, how much sights you use for those things that I mentioned, right? Just use enough to complete that task, right? It doesn't have to be perfectly precise, um, but grip is one of, it's probably, if not the most important ingredient, it is the most important ingredient would be the grip on the gun. Um, consistency of the grip, um, consistency of the velocity of the trigger press whether whether you're a pull straight through guy or you're a trigger prep guy do 85 90 percent of the uh, trigger pull um i'm a pull guy like i go straight to the trigger press i don't stop for a wall or sear or break or engagement and come to this you know 85 percent of the trigger press and i stop rehover realign reacquire sites redo all this stuff but cow and that's time and anticipation that builds up um you've already seen it you've already seen enough of it to place the sites on the target or the problem why are you not already have acquired the trigger and impress the trigger in that same time frame, right? So regardless if it's a USPSA A zone or a 200 pound dude standing there with a big butcher knife, gun, block, whatever, once my sights are placed over the target, not necessarily aimed, I press the trigger one fluid motion straight back to the rear with consistent velocity. And that doesn't change. Um, but for newer shooters, there's a little combination of understanding how the gun prints and to what distances, as T's asking here. Um, so when you look at it, like, is your gun zeroed? That's real for a handgun, whether it's red dots or irons, it's very mm -hmm. real. 
Um, how does it print at five, seven, 10, 15, 25 yards with, with you interfacing it and your ammo? Um, have you adjusted the sights to compensate or zero the pistol actually for your way of shooting? And once you understand that, um, ultimately like hard focus on the grip um, ultimately is 90% of the game, 85 to 90% mm -hmm. of the game is the grip. Uh, once the grip is consistent, remains consistent, trigger press is easy. Just pull the trigger to the rear without disturbing the sights. It's not hard. Um, people make it hard. People overcomplicate the task continually. Um, sounds smarter, I guess, than everybody else, but it, it, this isn't hard. We make it hard when we're self-defeating in that aspect. And we often, a lot of people try to sound like the smarter, bigger brain in the room about it. And this isn't hard. If, if that was the case, how do you explain a 64-year-old grandmother in Detroit who picks up a pistol and shoots three of the five guys in her house? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, like, so just be a little bit smarter about what you're doing and why with it and understand that the grip is probably one of the key most important factors in the entire equation. Because without it, you can't get the sights on target very well. Right? You, you can't get the sights relatively aligned because everything's janky at that point. So grip would be the biggest focus followed on by consistent trigger press. Yep. Yep. Very good stuff. Uh, let me ask you, uh, I, I know that patient for, you know, like the 25 yard B eights and stuff, which a lot of guys hate. Um, I, the past couple of years I've been living the B eight life and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I think it's a, I think it's a very good thing. And I think more shooters should, should do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, get a handle on actually being able to make accurate hits with the gun. One thing, though, that has happened is I think the training industry has definitely gone to a point where things are focused on being fast in li at limited ranges, those mm. things we think of typical ranges. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Okay, because sure. yes, most violent most violence happens at those ranges. Hey, listen, I'm I'm a guy who does IDPN USPSA mm -hmm. with a sub second draw from appendix and shit. Okay, sure. so I'm not bad mouthing that stuff at all. Yeah. But one thing it seems to me that the new generations of shooters have totally abandoned any kind of serious accuracy with a handgun because I can tell you that older guys I know who even used to shoot like the old PPC stuff, mm -hmm. those dudes can shoot at 25 and 50 yards like it's nothing. Oh, yeah. And and most guys today just just can't. What what are you seeing with that? Is, is it a there's generational a, thing? There's a balance I mean, in that crop, right? There's a balance with, with that crop. And we see this cycle come and go. Like, like I said, I've been doing this 20 odd years, right? I, I used to be the go fast guy. And then I was this guy and then go fast again. And then I'm at a point where I'm just like, look, I'd rather be smarter than anything else. Like, like absolutely. Like I know when the gun needs to be in my hand. I know about preemptive draws. I, I know about these things mm -hmm. and that's fine. Right. Like absolutely know about these things. But when you really look at most of the video stuff that you see with certain attacks and things like that, most people, even, I don't care how fast you are, you're not getting the gun out in time. I, I don't care that you're a sub second dude at three to five yards. Um, that's awesome. Uh, when it happens now, you're probably not going to get the gun out regardless of how mm -hmm. fast you are, or it's going to be fouled, right? Combatives are, you know, you see a lot of guys shoot at three yards. I'm like, that's grappling distance to me. Right. You, you know, three, three, three yards, like, like this reach, like here, like, yeah, man, we're fighting. Like we are hands on and we are slugging it out because you're probably not mm -hmm. going to get that gun out. It's going to be fouled. It's going to be tangled in clothing. Dude's going to be on top of you. I get that. Um, speed is real. Speed is important. Um, relative speed is important. Um, you should only do things, I believe, as fast as you can process information, as fast as you can think. That goes from shooting to anything else at that point, right? But th th there is a need for both. Now, there are some really good instructors out there that are fast and accurate. Th there absolutely are. Um, Nick from Velox Training Group, right? N Nick is a rock star. Um, Nick is one of the dudes that I look at and go, I wanted to be him 25 years ago. Like, like I wanted Nick's skill set, right? Um, Nick is a fantastic shooter, phenomenal guy. Um, just good person all the way around, right? Um, and you have other dudes, like like one of the guys who's been in this industry a long time with some of the most relevant experience in the world is Mike Pannone. Mike mm. Pannone's another one. You know, Mike's a great guy, mm. and he puts an emphasis on speed and accuracy as well. Um, you know, other guys, Chuck Pressburg. Chuck, Chuck Pressburg's mm. a friend, uh, amazing dude. When he developed No Fail Pistol, it came after some events that, that, that really required it. Um, so there's a combination of both. You should be good at both. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. you, you ultimately should spend time at both. Um, you know, B8s are one thing. Head boxes on a USPSA target at 25 is a favorite of mine. Um, a zones at 25 and 50 yards are a big favorite of mine where Alpha Charlie's acceptable. Um, 
you know, there's, there's a lot of good dudes out there teaching a lot of both. And it's important to be both. And there's a lot of guys that are just horrible at it. And they're one trick ponies at five, seven yards. Mm -hmm. And there's other dudes that are phenomenal at it. So again, choose wisely, but also be smart, right? Like if you have a problem shooting and you can't figure things out, you're not going to go to a go fast gun class because it's probably not the correct answer at that point. Right. Right. But your experience levels, things of that nature, like you're going to go take a class with Ernest Langdon. You're going to go take a class with Nick from Velox. You're going to go take a class with whomever else, right? You're, you're going to go seek these people out. Um, you know, so, th- so there are ways and it's a happy balance like anything else. You have to be good at both because you just don't know. And you can have both. But how much time are you willing to dedicate to get both, right? Everybody wants to run mm-hmm. a marathon until it's time to run a marathon, right? And, and so while all, you see a lot of guys, right? Hey, man, these dudes have drive. They will dry fire for 10, 15 minutes a day. They will do this. this they have the advantage of a range in their backyard, one of them. Um, cost of ammo, mm-hmm. right? For a right. lot of people, it's not that. But the range session, the practice sessions don't cost that much. But what it is, it's the dry time. Like you can get fast draw. How do you get a fast draw stroke? You get a timer and you do dry practice. Right, right. And you isolate everything. So, so that's the important part that nobody wants to put into work on, is the boring stuff, quote unquote. And that's dry time. Mm-hmm. And there is a balance of both. You should be good at both the speed and both the accuracy and speed and accuracy. Um, you know that term. You know it's a balance of speed and accuracy. That's crazy. We said that in the DVD, I think, in two thousand nine. Um, this is nothing new again, right? It just comes around every few cycles in the internet and it's a new group of instructors and it's a new crop of students, just a whole new genre of people. Right. So then that's good that the information is getting out and they kind of laugh at you like, like, yeah, dude, we, we did this, this time ago. And these guys were doing it before us, Mm -hmm. right? Just the equipment's gotten better. You know, we went from revolvers and full covered clamshell leather holsters, which weren't the fastest draws, right. To, (laughs) you know, 1911s. And more leather and more leather. And now we're back into Kydex. I still like leather. So I'm one of those guys too. But, you know, now we have better holsters, better equipment. You know, guys are like, oh, I've discovered appendix. I'm like, yeah, so did Yukon Cornelius. If you look at <laughs> right. that movie, he's got a, he's got a, he's got a single action Colt in there and he's got a knife. I'm like, hey man, he's the original Craig Douglas. Um, right, so, right. Right. So these are the things that people are just like, ah, you know, old is new, new is old again. And, and it's great to see. And, but again, you should be well balanced in both. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, yeah, before we get into anything else, we need to pay some love to our second sponsor, U.S. Law Shield. I'm going to drop the link in the comments. If you go to uslawshield.com slash ccx2, you get two free months added to your membership. So, Self-defense is an instinct. 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 If you're ever forced to make a life or death decision to protect yourself or your loved ones, you wouldn't hesitate. Would you? Would you? Don't let what could happen after become a courtroom nightmare. Get peace of mind for $10.95 a month. Get the best self-defense and concealed carry protection from U.S. Law Shield today. Sponsor. Absolutely. And we've discussed many times, this is, um, this is not the day and age you want to have to drop the hammer on somebody. God knows, you know, you, you, yeah. you need every resource in your corner. You need that kind of resource in your mm-hmm. corner. Um, and you know, speaking of which, just, just, uh, to looking at the U S law shield, uh, brings me back again to the class. One of the things you mentioned is in terms of low light, how that light, how, how do you put it, Steve? The light, you, the gun will save you, but et cetera. Let, yeah. Let uh, our folks the, hear that. The, the, the gun will save your life, but the light will save someone else's. And that that's a big rule that I live by with, with, with guns and, and lights and dark time. And, and that's just it. You know, unfortunately, we see tragic events every year of somebody shooting, you know, a spouse or one of their kids or somebody in the house, right? Like we see that all the time because, well, they didn't have a light or they shot in the dark or they did whatever mm-hmm. because, well, my 14 year old son, daughter was supposed to be in bed sleeping. Well, I remember when I was 14, like, like getting out of the house, go hang out with buddies, yeah. right? You're trying to sneak back in. Yeah. You know, mom's beating you with a broom handle for two hours afterwards. It's just bad. Um, nowadays it's, it's guns, right? E- e- even in other environments, right? So having a light, making sure you know what you're seeing and you're positively identifying at all costs. Mm-hmm. 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 You, you know, thinking back, uh, the earliest example of that i can think of again was a a teenager in the 90s reading in the newspaper of a guy who came home 
uh, the door was open, so he went in there like an idiot anyway. He thought nobody should be home. Well, he goes in there, and his own teenage daughter, you know, being a dumb kid, jumps out to scare him, and he shoots the girl. You know, and that that kind of stuff. Now, I don't know if low light was involved, whatever, but you know, things in dark environments like that have happened over and over again. And we it's covered that just a couple months ago. Some guy shot his son or daughter. We covered mm -hmm. it on the site. And yeah, I thought it was an intruder. No yeah. flashlight. No, no nothing. Know. Tragic things that could be that could be you know averted with a good application of white light. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And, you know, along that vein, you went into the class also, you know, uh, better seeing the environment hitting innocent people is always a, a very real thing. And, uh, you know, a, a few months ago, we did an article specifically about that. So um, I decided to address that topic and I just did some research only going back the previous year. I could not believe how many incidents there actually are of civilians hitting innocent people. Be you know, because a lot of people have said, oh, yeah, the NYPD does that, but it does. you don't see it anywhere else. Uh, let me tell you, there are many, many incidents of people either not identifying the target or not paying attention to the background, and they're hitting innocent people. So, again, hearkening back to carrying the light at night for a dark environment. Vision, vision processing plays a huge role in shooting defensive target shooting matches events whatever it is um it, it does it, it's a very real thing and uh, unfortunately again it does happen and i think people overestimate their abilities based on capabilities of the equipment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just take you, you do you see a lot of what goes on in these instances do you think people are just are, is it just that they're so panicked in the moment they're unaware or do you think that does go on people overestimate what that they can they think they can make shots that mm -hmm. they can't make combination. Combination. Yeah. Combination. Combination. <laughs> yeah combination yeah yeah uh, again, after doing the research for that one article, I, I was kind of shocked myself because I, I know that it happens. But if we just looked at, and I know Luke, you and Brandon both cover many, many of these incidents right. on the sites, you know, that you pull from local news sources. And it was kind of staggering how many, if you just go back a few months, of, you know, I innocent people getting hit. And, of course, you have the law enforcement stuff happening. That one girl who was shot in the dressing room and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So that's a given, and that that's more high profile. But, again, I, I'm telling everybody in the audience, civilians are doing this a lot, a lot more than, than you would think. It's real. <laughs> it's very real. Yeah. So... Um, did we? I think we hit on some of the the good stuff that that yeah, came we can in. Um, a couple of these, like, how do you feel about rechargeable lights? Uh, I'm a big fan of a, a lot of rechargeable fuel cells for batteries, uh, especially today's day and age. So, uh, most of the lights that I use, um, they're either mod light, surefire, stream light, or um, cloud. I, I have a pretty good game mm -hmm. and some Phoenix lights. Um, I, I like having rechargeable batteries. There are some lights that you can recharge with the batteries in them. Um, I'm not going to mention any of their names because they're garbage. Um, they're not I'm a just, sponsor. No, good. I don't oh. care about Olight. I think they're the worst light known to mankind <laughs> ever, and they consume me, and I don't care. Um, I, I really don't. Uh, the, 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 the amounts of them that I've seen in courses in that have just been astronomically problem child, children. And um, just you're talking weapon mounted lights and their flashlights. Handheld. Yeah, and their handhelds. Um, but other lights that have that availability, right? Like Streamlight. Streamlight has that HLX5, that big house light kind of thing. I have a couple of those stacked around the house. I love that light. Um, great light. Undo the batteries, charge them. You're good to go. Others have different fast type chargers like almost you would for your cell phone, right? right. Um, for, for me, though, good set of rechargeable batteries. I keep a couple sets on hand. They're in a constant rotation for my house lights, things of that nature, my personal carry lights. Um, but I like rechargeable cells. As far as the overall rechargeable lights, I haven't seen very many that have done great. I, I don't explore them that often. So, so you're saying overall a light that will take the batteries that the individual batteries recharge. Right. Yeah, think, like typically perform better than like the USB compatible light itself and you have to charge the light. Yeah. And I, like I said, I've only seen a couple of those and I, I haven't invested the money into many of them. I'm sure there's a couple of really good ones out there. The technology has been there for eons. Why wouldn't it be? Um, just like the Stiletto 
something like that. So the stiletto is one of them, right? The stiletto, I love the stilettos. Um, okay. The stiletto pro is one of my go-to lights for a lot of stuff. And I like that light a lot. And that is generally one of the lights you will see on me a lot of times is the pro. Yeah. The that pro is, is a good just, light. It's brighter, more lumens than the regular. Yeah. Brighter, more right? lumens, aluminum yeah. housing versus polymer housing. That's all. One's like 600 lumens. The other is a thousand. Um, but I like the stiletto. The stiletto series is one of the only ones that I really like the rechargeable system on. Gotcha. Mm, yes. Makes sense. Uh, I mean, it seemed to me one of the main drawbacks of if you only have a light that has to be recharged itself, if it goes dead in the field, then you have to recharge it. Whereas yeah. if it's rechargeable batteries, you just switch batteries. Exactly. Right. So you, so you have the option there. Um, for me, like with the stiletto, it's nice because you know, I'll charge it in the truck. I've got a battery pack, you know, booster pack for your cell phone a lot of times, especially if I'm out on extended hunts or trips like that. Um, I, I can often use that to recharge it. So, so there's variables to that, but the Pro, the Stiletto Pro series is about the only one that I really have a ton of experience enough with to comment on. Otherwise, I would just be guessing at this point. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yep. Well, That's we're great. coming up on an hour and we try to keep these to an hour. And we have whatever I got all long. night. Nobody likes you if you're quitters. Nobody likes quitters. <laughs> you always do an after dark show. But anyway, um, always. We haven't uh, done this in a while. What's your no. what's your carry gun? And I guess what do you what light do you carry? Oh, that's a tough call. My carry gun changes every couple of days. Right, <laughs> it really does. Um, depends on if you're hunting deer or not. It depends on what I'm doing. <laughs> like honestly, like, like there's times like it, it could be everything from uh, an agency arms Glock 48 with a dot um, to a Nighthawk 1911 and 45 government gun with iron sights, and that's it. You, you know, so it varies just on depends on me the day and the mood. Um, so it does change frequently from Glocks to 1911s predominantly, um, okay. big ones and little ones. Right, that's that's about where I live for. Even though there's others there, Browning High Power comes out on occasion because I like carrying a high power because they're just gorgeous guns. And who doesn't like a high power? If you don't, you're not American. Um, I'll just say that right now. Um, so for me, like a lot of a lot of 1911s, custom 1911s, uh, a lot of Glocks in the Armory, a few other guns, you know, FNs, you know, Smiths, things like that. Uh, light wise, um, generally you're either going to find a stiletto pro depending on my type of dress and what I'm doing. If it's more businessy attire and, you know, meetings and stuff like that, it's definitely going to be a stiletto pro cause it's not very obtrusive to the print Flatter. of what I'm wearing. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. I know that. Um, it's an easy light to carry inside the waistband as well. Um, mm -hmm. after that, it's going to be a mod light. It's probably going to be a, um, two cell, the 18650 body with a PLHB two head on it. Um, predominantly for the big boy light and occasionally uh, one of the cloud uh, lights, their high output one I have um, in the single cell version. That's That's been pretty nice, but uh, ultimately it's going to be a mod light about 90% of the time to the, also with the Stiletto Pro taking up the rest of the time. Hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Pretty neat, pretty neat. And uh, you're, you're known for uh, doing a lot of teaching with, handgun red dots i i've heard you mention this so i i want to get your opinion um i just did an experiment i i've been kind of a holdout with the dot life right so i just in the past few months put a dot on a uh on a on a you saving up to be poor <laughs> you? yeah so so no i've just been a holdout so i i finally i finally embraced the dot life at least to say i can do it so here here's what i came away with it from um I literally wrote an article and took some video of the first 100 rounds through the gun, but after doing several weeks of dry fire workup with it. And basically, I said, guys, it is not rocket science. You just have to get that presentation solid so that you can see the dot. And I'm sticking to it, Steve. I don't see why there needs to be separate classes for both. There what do you doesn't. think? Okay. There doesn't. Um, so, so here's the thing. Like, I've been shooting red dots on pistols since 1999. Um, that was my first red dot handgun. Um, here's the thing. Like outside of a few technical points with mounting and lights and the plate systems and the Ys behind open versus closed emitters, um, awesome. It's the same thing as shooting iron sights, right? You, you focus on the thing. Mm -hmm. that's trying to hurt you that you see because you need visual <laughs> of it. So your eyes go to what is trying to hurt you. That would be called target focus right? Because you're going to go to that. And then you're going to place the gun in between you and them in your eyes where your front sight would drop in or your red dot would drop in. Amazing. And then you're <laughs> going to press the trigger. This isn't hard, right? Um, th th there's a lot of little little 
technical points, right, for newer shooters with a red dot or departments looking to do things with a red dot. It's just, we, we don't teach red dot carbine classes. Why are we teaching red dot pistol classes? Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I tell this in every red dot class, you don't need to be here. It's just a pistol class with, with a different sighting system. That, that's all it really is. But I, I, again, it, it's not if, you, if your grip and presentation are lousy with iron sights, they're going to be right. lousy with a red dot. That, that right. There's no difference between the two. There is no magic grip. There is no magic presentation. No matter what BS somebody's trying to spin on you, there's none of that. It is nothing more than a consistent grip drawn presentation of the gun, just like your iron sights. You place them between you and the thing you want to shoot, where your eyes are looking, and you depress the trigger without disrupting the sights or minimally disrupting the sights as much as possible. That's it. There is no other magic to it other than your zero distances. And that's like an AR zero. Pick one. Just know mm -hmm. what it does in all the different distances. Mm -hmm. It's not hard. It's all made up garbage. I'm going to put it out there, hands down, 110%. Okay. No, I, I, I wanted, I wanted you to do so because again, that was my experience. I've been a holdout with the dots. I don't claim to be any kind of guru with the dot, but, but I actually kind of came to the conclusion that you know what? Put in the effort. Don't even burn ammo doing it. Put in the effort. Dry that presentation solid, and and it's going to be there. Okay. So it's that's just crazy what... how that works. Stop it. And here's the thing. <laughs> this is coming. This is coming from a guy who teaches red dot classes, right? This is a guy who teaches red dot classes, and, and there is. There's little technical data points, right? There's little key pieces to the ingredient that makes life easier. Mm -hmm. After that, it's just a shooting class. Mm -hmm. So what do I need to learn to do with a red dot differently than I do iron sights? Track lateral targets left to right. Okay, cool story, bro. You move your eyes. You stop your eyes to the spot you want the gun to stop, and the dot is there, and you press the trigger just like your iron sights. That's crazy. Um, let me think what else is there that's magic. So sometimes I have this conundrum, right? I don't know if I should use my iron sight grip with my red dot trigger press, or if I should use my red dot grip with my iron sight trigger press, because those are all completely different things. Um, or is it my, so, so this is it, right? It doesn't matter. The grip and the trigger press are the same for either freaking gun, mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. either sighting system. It doesn't matter. So, so I like throwing that out to people. I'm like, so, okay, hey man, like what grip are you using today? Like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, you have a red dot. Yeah, but you had an iron sight. Like, yeah. So which grip are you using? Are you using your red dot grip or your iron sight grip? Which one? <laughs> like, what? I'm like, which trigger press are you using for this? Are you using your, your, your red dot trigger press or your iron sight trigger press? Like, which one is it today? Because I need to know. Because this is going to help me help you. I squeeze more with my pinky when I have a red dot than versus. Yeah, right. Like, you should Whatever. be doing the entire time. It right. doesn't matter. It's all stupid. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's marketing and it's huff and it's fluff for people. And I tell guys, you don't, and I tell the opening line in my red dot class is you don't need this class. It's just a handgun shooting course uh, mm -hmm. with a different sighting system, which is now the normal sighting system for most places. Like mm -hmm. I'm going to be innovative and teach an iron sight pistol class because I think that's going to take off in the next year or two. <laughs> I really believe there's something to that. Um, right. Oh, it, 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 you know, it, it just hurts at, at times. It really does. I mean. Yeah. But Steve, do you think that's the way it's going to go? I mean, now that dots are so prevalent, it's just going to be shooting clay. I, I mean, the way I look at it, if you're any kind of instructor, you really should be solid on both at this point. If yeah, you're not already, it's, it's you know, it's, it's the same process. Nothing right. has changed, right? Me and Tim Heron have this talk all the time, and we just laugh. And a couple other guys, right? It, it's no different. Um, I, I took a lot of grief uh, in, in the late years at one of my other jobs uh, because I was shooting a dot gun. Because well, that's cheating. I'm like. You put one on the carbine, right? Yeah. Why don't you put one on your pistol? And this was going back to 2000. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first time people really saw RMRs was around 2007. Before that, we had Bushnells and aim points on guns and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, and we were doing some stuff with Trigicon at the time who were local to me. And I was doing a course for a bunch of their people and doing some consulting for them. I was paid by them at one point in time. And I'm like, this is going to be really awesome on a handgun. You, you know, they had them mounted on carbines. So, well, yeah, and the, the thought process was already there, obviously, because they already had the Dr. J-Point optics on handguns. We saw those in 2000, right? I mean, so this is nothing new. It's just new to certain people that are now coming up with this. Like, oh, this is bullseye shooters were using these things forever. You, you look back, yes, like, yep. like, right. you know, like Cohen and those guys, Doug Caning and those guys were using them to win Bianchi Cup in the late 80s, and mm -hmm. 90s in action matches. This is nothing new. They've just gotten better. Again, technology, right? It's catching up. They're getting smaller. They're getting better. And that's it. This is nothing new, people. It's not. So stop it. Stop trying to overcomplicate a process that is not complicated. You make it hard. Nobody else yeah. does. It's stupid. And Steve Fisher will 
fix you up whether you're using irons or dots, correct, Steve? Iron, iron course or a red dot course? <laughs> it depends on which one you want to do. I don't care either way. Bring, bring what you got, man. It doesn't matter. It really right. doesn't. Um, uh, but, but, you know, the, the benefits, right? There are some benefits to the dot eye, actually. You know, speed, speed at distance, um, aging eyes, mm. low light, low light. Yeah. Yep. So, so there are benefits to the dot. Absolutely. That should be explored. But, comma, it's, you're not shooting the gun any differently. So what does it matter? Recoil control is recoil control. Grip is grip. Trigger press is trigger press. Just your sight changes on top of the gun doesn't mean a thing. Yep. Yep. Very cool. Very cool. All right. So should that be a wrap, Luke, uh, before Brandon so. freaks out? He freaks out if we go way over an hour because supposedly he has to have it an hour long to fit on Instagram, yet I've yet to see any of these videos yeah, go on. We're just Instagram. trying to keep him to an hour. So if there's more to say, then we can have Here, Here's the thing. Then... Brandon's not here. What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Sorry, yeah. dude. You're not here. So. <laughs> Well, it's great having you on now. Maybe we can. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, definitely. We hit on some, some good stuff. And, you know, those interested, take a look at Sentinel Concepts, the 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 website, because I know you, you do pretty much everything, Steve, right? Uh, carbine, shotgun, the, the whole gamut. Yeah, shotgun, handgun, carbine stuff, um, low light, basically. I mean, uh, again, it's just a different environment of doing things with a different tool. It's, most of the principles are pretty much all the same. Gotcha. Mm. If you could only do one, what would it be? Ooh. Ooh, you would ask that. Um, low light. Low light. I think if in the class you mentioned be, that, yeah. If it could only be one course across the board, it would be like the old days of multiple days of low light. Because I can teach you to shoot a gun in the dark. It's easy, right? It's even easier to shoot a gun in low light than it is in daytime because outside influences are gone. Your vision is more con concentrated to the target because of the light. Um, I could teach you a basic handgun class in the dark. And it's not Absolutely. as hot usually, right? <laughs> hey, you're the one who lives in the swamp. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're talking about like, like yeah, you choose to live there. I'm like, not right now. It sucks. No, no. Like there in Arizona, like I stopped going to those places like around second week, third week of April. That was about mm -hmm. it. Beginning of May was iffy. After that, forget it. No, it was like 101 outside today. It sucks. Oh, that's not bad. I know. Well, it still sucks. That's tolerable. It still sucks. <laughs> How long have you lived there? I don't want to hear it. Like, I was then, then you guys complain about snow. You're like, but it's cold up there. I'm like, I can put layers on. I'm fine. Uh, I'm I'm, I'm right there cold. with you. I'm yeah. right there with you. I I dread the the winter months waning, honestly, because believe it or not, here in Northern Virginia, it's hot as all hell. I mean, it's so you have you have the worst of all worlds you don't have the best of both worlds you have the worst of both worlds you have serious winters and hellaciously hot summers look look virginia gets a quarter inch of flurries on the ground the world ends it's an apocalypse and you people are all stuck on 95 like I don't. oh yeah problems. yeah like, like uh -huh. no, nobody cares about your problems there like everybody with the most awesome vehicles and all your electronic cars are stuck dead on the road i don't care um, yeah, yeah. No, but 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 again it's like it's watching nascar it's it's great when it happens i've been in north carolina during ice storms and that and i'm driving and i'm just watching people i'm like what are you mm -hmm. doing yeah you know it's great but louisiana is awesome though. i i do love louisiana i love getting there except for in the middle of summer mm -hmm, like there's too. no doubt about it man and the food just the food is great man and it's just a great place for culture and food too it's just wild i love it down there and i bet they have a lot of great bourbon ironically yeah. There's a good cigar shop in the corner though that I like. There's a really good cigar shop down in the corner that I do enjoy going to. So yeah. bring the gun just in case. So <laughs> every time I'm there, if you're gonna get into a gunfight, it's gonna be Chicago or the French Quarter. It's gonna uh -huh. be different. And 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 Louisiana, um, I I think it, uh, Dr. William April, the late William April, I believe he he was from uh, New Orleans, and I remember him saying that uh, our our criminals are just good shooters. It's like if you look at statistically, they kill each other at a much higher rate than anywhere else. He said, "What can I say? Even our criminals are good shooters down there." So if you shoot at people a hundred times, you're bound to hit something eventually. So yeah, maybe it's a crazy right. tale. Let's wrap this up. Thanks for being on. It was an awesome show. Um, our next show for everybody, it's going to be on the 28th. And if you ask the question, watch the show, you're going to win a weapon mounted light that we talked about tonight. So. Nice. An old light. No, no, no. That was a stream light. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> I hate you. No, stream light. Awesome. All right. See y'all guys in two weeks. And that's it. <laughs>